of immersive technologies to expand our senses is computationally there. It's technically there. And the, the ability for them to expand our senses, to connect us, to connect us to each other, it's there. But the success of them, of these technologies, is only going to be there. It's going to be about not how much data it can collect. It's about how much data it throws away and how it knows what to throw away, what to wait, what's relevant. And it's going to be about knowing about the perceptual units and knowing how we experience the world and being able to represent our realities rather than the world as it is. So I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by that. We have control as developers. Uh, ambiguity is something that gives us a particularly powerful tool. All right, I'm going to be pretty old school with music for a while, so just hang in there with me. I promise I'll make it current eventually. <laughs> But all right, so let's listen to this. this there, hopefully, most of you know this at least. All right, uh, great tune. It's, it's relevant. We'll get there. OK, so has anyone heard that you can kind of hear funky messages in Led Zeppelin when you play it backwards, maybe? A little bit? Have you heard them? No, maybe? All right, so I'm going to play it backwards for you, and, and I want you to listen really hard to see if you hear anything, OK? <laughs> What did you think? It's like, maybe a little bit, maybe you heard that. It could have been about satin shoes if I was really thinking about shopping, probably, but no. All right, now. What about now? What if I just give you a little boost in the right direction? <laughs> so I'd like to give Led Zeppelin the credit for that one, but it's actually our brain doing a pretty awesome job. Uh, th these are examples where our brain is taking advantage of our priors, our probabilistic expectations, to get us to actionable states. Your brain wants as much as it can to get you to, to make sense of the world. And typically, we experience the world not at all as it is. We're always experiencing the world in some state of illusion. But it's actually our brain really getting it right and making us effective. And when we think about technologies and we think about where we are computationally and the way we can think about perception and experience, we want to be thinking about perceptual units. It's all about how well can we represent the world we experience rather than the world as it is. Because I promise the world as it is is changing all the time. So, I, I like to say we think about, at least at Dolby, um, the thing, things we always want to do is we want to maximize our perceptual control. We've got to understand that. We've got to be able to build models that make sense of the world that we're trying to replicate. And then we want to be able to enhance our physiological experience. We want to engage, use technology to engage as best as we can that leverages what our bodies do really awesomely already. And then we want to use that to, be able to really create the technologies of the future. Now, I'm going to use this time to tell you sort of a story I'd like to tell and take us through um, a cycle, what I call the cycle of creation and innovation, where we go from artistic mastery and insight. You know, great artists have amazing insight to the way the brain works. And, and they, they may use different words than I do and different words than you do, but they get it. They get it very well. And then the next stage being we, we start to describe those things theoretically, and then we move to where we can computationally model this. And once we can computationally model things, we turn them into al algorithms. And, and that's sort of where I live right now, is somewhere in that space. And once we start doing that, we're able to build technologies that affect us today, but also inform the artists of the future. 
So we'll start with this. I'm a violinist uh, by trade back in the day, and uh, so we're, this is a solo box sonata number two on Dante in A minor. Beautiful feast, but that's obviously one violin playing. You hear how many voices? Definitely more than one. You hear multiple voices. Bach was a master at understanding how to create multiple voicings and how to have our brains interpret what's coming from one source as multiple voices, multiple objects, lines moving in different directions. It, it, in, in, you might call it a, uh, a lot of what he innately understood uh, governed the rules of counterpoint, which for composers of many hundreds of years is sort of like a recipe, a, might, a book of manners that told people how to create. If you follow these rules, you will, you will build, write a composition that is experienced and perceived as having multiple voices. Again, it's always about perception. But what, what Bach did innately, we've been trying to describe and understand and make models of for many years. So the next stage is this understanding of how do we, how does our brain take this mess of sound waves and turn it into what we just experienced, which is multiple voices. And so I want to take you through some of the steps that get us there. The theoretical description of what's happening in that case, uh, a man, the, there's a man named Al Bregman who I worked with many years ago, and he, he, just sort of just, he gave this title to it. But think about it. The way we hear sound is very different. It's obviously very different than the way we see. But to be able to tell where objects are and make delineations of the visual world, you have this beautiful spatial map that is interpreted by your brain. And that is re it's continuously represented throughout each area of your brain. But for sound, all of the sound waves that are occurring are getting intermixed before they even reach your brain. Right? By the time they reach your ear, every, your brain is dealing with a mass of sound waves that are intermixed, and your brain has to get represented on your cochlea, and all of the frequencies, the richness of my voice, every sound that's happening has to be decomposed, and it, that's what happens on your cochlea. It basically acts like a Fourier transform, but it's decomposed, but then it has to be reassembled to be actionable objects and understand a talker from a dog, from a violin, or from a different line you're hearing. And that's a really complex problem. And it's an incredible one that our brain does. Um, one way that I'll use to describe it, which I really like, is it's akin to you're watching a lake. And you can only watch this little square meter of the lake and the waves on that lake. And you have to know how many boats are on that lake, where they are, how fast they're moving, and what the wind speed is just by watching a few waves. And people can do that, but our ear does it exceptionally well. Okay? So this is a, what we call auditory scene analysis. And it turns out that, obviously, Bach understood that when he was creating music. And that's where these rules came from. They came from strong intuitions and probabilistic expectations that made him realize that this is what we would experience if we did this. Then we describe them. And, you know, in describing them, it turns out there are some actually pretty simple theoretical principles that we can use to describe them, and we can even use uh, to enhance the types of technologies we're building today. So let me give you an, a, a step back. How many people have heard of Gestalt grouping principles in the audience? So a lot of you are designers, and these are very rich in thinking about how we understand the visual world. Well, it turns out they actually help us understand how we organize sound and how we experience sound in the world. So for a bit of history. I'm, I'm going to do Gestalt. Uh, I'm going to start with what I call this as sort of a homogeneous uh, grid on the, on the screen. You know, in, in no particular way you might organize it other than you might see a square. But I can bias you or influence you to see this in different ways. Uh, again, this is simple. It's more philosophical. It's to get the right language and tools for thinking about how the world around you might be organized and the problem your brain's having to solve. So let's think about proximity, things that are close together. It changes how I organize the, these elements, right? I can hopefully most of you now see columns. But I'll 
promise you, now hopefully most of you see Rose, I promise you we all have slightly different biases, different expectations. We don't see these things the same way, and if you think we do, you're wrong. We all have our own expectations that drive how we're going to want to, how our brain deals with this kind of information. Now, what about similarity? This is a good one. So I can take, you know, and obviously if I use colors that are closer to one another in the color space, I mean, it's going to be a less strong pull than it might be if they're very different, distant. And then I can put two elements against one another, proximity and similarity. And now I've got, I've got a, a, a sort of a fight going on in my brain about how I might organize these. And, and for me, in this case, uh, proximity wins out. But that is the state of what happens all the time. There are many principles for how your brain is trying to organize information. And they're constantly waiting and probabilistically determining how that information gets reorganized and what it ultimately belongs to. You know, common fate, things that move together or follow a constant trajectory are likely our brain is looking for that expectation. Closure and figure ground, if you want to think about, I'll show you a visual example, but this is the same reason why we experience, uh, can, can listen to a record with, a big, with scratches on it and still experience music. Everywhere there's a scratch, all that information has been removed, yet your brain does not hear a discontinuity in the music. We experience music and we hear you know, noise or scratches, but it's as if it's a second voice, a second object. I've spent a lot of time studying the neuroscience at single, single cell level to understand why that happens, because it's critical to us being effective and efficient in the world. Here, it's like our brain wants to make sense of objects and figure out where there's occlusion, where there's information, there must be something missing. All right, so I'm gonna give you a couple of sound examples where we're going to start really simple and build up to how we are thinking, how you can think about our brain's ability to form voices here. So you're going to hear a galloping sequence. And apologies for using beeps and buzzes in a talk about music, but it all starts from something. So you're going to hear doo -doo 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 -doo, okay? And you'll either hear it this way, or you'll hear something that starts to sound like this, okay? What I'm gonna going to ask you to do is try as hard as you can to hear it in this sort of galloping pattern. And raise your hand when you can no longer hear it that way, okay? So here we go. Okay, so I'm going to play it one more time, and this time I want you to try to hear it as two streams right away, or raise your hand as soon as you can. So, in that simple example, a few things happen. The first time I played it for you, I was trying to ask you to hear it a certain way. And at some point, your brain couldn't, you couldn't hear it that way. And that we can predict and we can model based on uh, the uh, <coughs> responses of your neurons in your, in your cortex. And we can make a prediction at what point it has to do with the distance between frequencies and the timing. And it, it, the further away they are, the slower it has to be. You have an expectation. The closer together they are, you, have to, you can go really fast and still hold it together. But what did you notice? The second time, when I asked you to pull apart and hear it differently, you could do it right away. So this is the power of your attention to drive how you experience something as simple as that. But trust me, all music, all sound allows you to do that. Now, I'm going to show you an example which I really like. This, this is one that, that Al Brigman had used. So and this is an African xylophone. And it's a particularly good example for where two players are playing together, very close together. And they are uh, playing isochronous rhythms. So that means rhythms that are perfectly even. Do, 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 do. No asynchronies, uh, nothing, nothing fancy. Uh, but 
we've made a completely homogeneous field like we did with a visual system. So because they're close together, we don't have spatial proximity. We don't, I mean, spatial distance. They're playing the same instrument. It has the same timbre. And I want to sort of give you an example of how your brain reorganizes the voicings in ways that completely change how you can experience that world. OK, so this is the first player and what they're going to play. Here is the second player. OK? So you, you get it. They're each playing perfectly isochronous rhythms. Now I'm going to put them together and see what happens. The lines on top are sort of giving you the, the uh, temporal groupings. Powerful, eh? So it, it's what we call it's grouping based on proximity. Suddenly, the frequency is overriding the fact that they're coming from different voices. But if I simply shift the timbre of these, so now they're different. You lose this. You lose all of the synchronies and the melodies of the movement the difference if we go back to the same timbres. And clearly, there are other artists who I love when they take completely dissimilar elements and manage to create single voicings that our brain puts together as a single stream, right? So, and I promise you, I've spent a lot of time playing with this. You know, if I obviously, if we, if you speed that up in different ways, you get very different. Or obviously, it's not going to be in seven anymore. And suddenly, you're going to have all sorts of different groupings because it's all about how your brain is organizing the information. All right. So at this point in time, we have a theoretical model, right? We have theoretical principles that we can use, and we have underlying neuroscience that we can actually use to make predictions about those perceptual units. What matters here, in the same way that compression algorithms, things like MP3 and Dolby Digital, all take advantage of an, a perceptual model to drive how we deal with the data, how we deal with information, and to effectively perceptually reduce information in a way that isn't just mathematic, mathematical. It's really driven on what we experience in the world. Perceptual units of the scene of how we organize information are critical to intelligent technologies, machine learning, and, and how we, machine perception. But how, how can we use this in technology? So where I want to take you now is how we've implemented. The, it's all about the object. So I've given you some examples where we, you've seen how malleable and contextually driven our brain is to experience objects. So if we can use the propensity of our brain to experience objects, that might be something that can enhance our experiences in different ways. So <clears throat> one thing that we did, Dolby did, many, uh, about f five years ago now is move away from the idea of channels, channel-based audio. And I'll tell you why. So channels are really taking a mixer is mixing sound and mapping it to a limited number of channels. But it's it's really in the reproduction and playback, it's already been intermixed. And that's basically taking an, the world that we, as humans, experience spatially and our, the power of objects around us and squashing that three-dimensional world into two dimensions. So in this case, I really like to look at it as we, we, we looked at, essentially took a, whoa. a nod from the gaming industry. And in the gaming industry, the notion of objects and elements in the objects, elements in the scene has been around for a while. And you can actually get Overwatch now in Dolby Atmos but, um, for headphones. But the element, the, the idea that we sound is 
tied with a data stream. It becomes a very powerful element. So the way that we transformed cinema audio has a huge impact on thinking about the relevant units that make the most sense to engage our physiology and engage how we experience the world. So if you go back to prior to Dolby Atmos or other, there are other object-based uh, cinema technologies, what would happen, maybe there would still be 65 speakers in a cinema, but those 65 speakers would be responding with regard to channels. They would be responding as if, as banks of speakers that would all simultaneously respond, okay? That, that's a very limited experience to how the human engages in the world around them. So today what happens is every sound element is attached with a data stream. That data stream tells you in X, Y, Z coordinates where the sound should be. It tells you how diffuse the sound should be. It tells you how loud the sound should be. But it lives with the sound. And in the future, it could tell you what the emotional impact of that sound could be. It can, have, it can personalize the sound. That's where we're at today with the power of what we can do. And it allows us to think in objects. It allows us to think in these perceptual units that matter. So in cinema audio, we've been able to create this immersive experience. But the next stage is how do we get from creating an immersive experience that is perceptually motivated, leverages our physiological experience of the world as richly as possible, to creating tools beyond cinema design and sound design for new musical artists. And that's where we're at today. And, and this is a, a great example, I think, of one of the uh, a few engineers at Dolby recognizing the impact that this, our technology, this technology could have on music. So I'm going to give you a quick tour here, where we've taken Dolby Atmos and put it in the club. We've been partnering with Ministry of Sound and working with a lot of different artists to explore how object-based audio and Dolby, and Dolby Atmos are able to create a more immersive, more visceral experience in the club scene. And from the notion of thinking about objects, thinking how we per perceptually experience the world and wanting to leverage and engage our physiology and the propensity of our brain to make sense of objects and track those objects as powerfully as possible, it's, it's a great opportunity. So I'll give you a quick tour. We were really excited straight away about the Dolby Atmos idea. We've always wanted to do something different with the live shows and have that extra element, you know, rather than just, you know, turning up and playing your music. I think the best way to describe the difference is you're going to feel the difference of the music moving around you physically. It's, it's almost like I want to jump into the, uh, into the middle of the crowd and hear it myself. What it really can help with is having one sound that you really want to stick out during the mix. Just by taking that one part and then making that move in a different direction to everything else to be able to give that extra experience to the fan that we wanted them to have. All right. So <laughs> I like to say art inspires science. So the, the, we just had the new Bach on stage, I guess, a, a few, about an hour ago. <laughs> but art inspires science. Science enables innovation. And it's, it's this cycle that really lets us get to a point. If we think perceptually, and try to understand that we have to be thinking about the realities that we experience, not the realities that might exist. That's when we can actually engage and enhance our senses in ways that we're only beginning to, to realize. So look forward to it. Thank you very much. <laughs>